Hare Krishna and welcome everyone to uh, the second session of today's uh, for our weekend retreat. Uh, on behalf of the retreat team, I would like to offer my uh, our obeisances to you all. Please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to His Holiness Chandra Moli Swami. So thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, for another enlightening session. So this afternoon we have uh, our very dear His Grace Buddha Bhavan Prabhu speaking on Srila Prabhupada's seven purposes. So uh, before I hand it over to Buddha Bhavan Prabhu, just a, a couple of uh, housekeeping points. So we will be taking questions uh, towards the end of the session. If I can kindly ask you all to direct your questions to uh, Anjali Mataji, you will see uh, on the chat, it says questions dash Anjali. So please direct your questions there. So without further ado, I'd just like to, Bhutabhavan Prabhu doesn't need so much of an introduction, but we would like to uh, introduce you just very briefly. So I just wanted to uh, share something about Bhutabhavan Prabhu. His Grace Bhutabhavan Prabhu from London is a graduate from LSC, London School of Economics, where he studied politics and philosophy and further obtained a master's from Burbeck University of London, one of the UK's leading philosophy departments. Since then, Bhutabhavan Prabhu has been a motivation and leadership consultant while actively partaking in multiple government educational and charitable initiatives, adding value through leadership, motivational and meditation workshops. He came to Krishna Consciousness by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada's books, receiving a book in central London that just transformed his life and ultimately led him to his spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami, whose revolutionary teachings he imbibes with much depth and authenticity. He is one of the most prolific speakers in our movement, a spiritual guide, mentor, and dear friend to many. His aim to encourage us all to energize each other to keep moving forward with determination to serve Srila Prabhupada. Bhutabhavan Prabhu really is an inspiration of a devotee and touches the hearts of all he meets, not only touching their hearts, but transforming them too. So Bhutabhavan Prabhu, we'd like to warmly welcome you to deliver this afternoon's session, Srila Prabhupada's Seven Purposes. Over to you, Buddha Baba and Prabhu. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so I'll just um, say Mangal Acharya, and then we'll go from there. Nagyana to Narandasya. Yananjana Shilakaya, Chekshu, Militam Yunitas Maishri, Rave Namahashi Chitani Manobish, Tam Stapitam Yen, the Bukale, Swayam Rupakadama Yam Dadati, Swapadanti Kam, Vande Ham Shri Guru, Shri Yutta, Padakamalam, Sri Guru, Vaishnavamstra. Sri Rupam Sagajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vatam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vatam Sacha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatvate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaskate Tabta Kanchana Gorangi Radha Vrindavan Ishri Sorry, Krishna, everyone. So I want to begin by offering my humble obeisance to His Holiness Chandra Mui Maharaj and to all the assembled Vaishnavas 
and uh, to all of you, especially to Maharaj, to request permission and blessings to also speak something um, on this really auspicious disciples retreat made more auspicious because first we have the association of real sadhus such as Chandramuli Maharaj and when we are coming together to glorify Srila Prabhupada then that is a huge blessing. So I want to say thank you to Maharaj for first of all even allowing us to, to speak. Um, I was thinking how to begin this. I, I, I feel that the appropriate way to begin is just to also begin by just giving a note of thanks. I was studying, I am studying the Srimad Bhagavatam and um, very, very kind of detailed overview. And one of the things I was re recently studying about the first canto the first canto of Bhagavatam, we hear how the Bhagavatam manifested. We hear how it was passed from Brahma to Narada. Narada passes it to Vyasa. Vyasadeva passes it to Shukadeva Goswami. Shukadeva Goswami explains it to Pariksit Maharaj. And within that assembly, Sutta Goswami is also there. And then Sutta Goswami will explain that same understanding that he heard to the sages of Nemi Sharanya. And one of the things I was picking up in the studies is how the first canto deals with what is called Adhikari Tattva. So it, it gives a methodology by which all the other cantos can be understood. And that methodology is the science of respect or the science of hearing and speaking. Shravanam Kirtanam. And I was thinking about this in relation to His Holiness Chandra Muli Maharaj. The point that when we have association of very, very senior, real sadhus, those who have genuinely dedicated their lives to the propagation of Krishna consciousness, dedicated their lives to Srila Prabhupada, then it gives, us, it gives us tremendous blessings. I was at a house program a few years ago, and John William Maharaj was speaking, and um, after he left, there was a deity of Nishingadev. So to be very honest, I prayed to the deity after Maharaj left. And you know, to be honest, something happened. There was some reciprocation. And at first I thought it was me. And then I realized later on that no, when you're in the presence of advanced devotees, and this is also mentioned in Shastra, by their blessings, Krishna becomes responsive to our spiritual desires. So just in awareness of the fact that my own spiritual master is no longer physically here, I also see how, how lucky we are. And this is also pr something that Prabhupada taught both by example and by scripture, and we'll talk about that as we go through, about the importance of a culture of respect, respect for sadhus. So I think it's really important just to recognize that we're, we're lucky to be in such exalted association, and that by, by being here, we can, also, we can also come closer to Krishna through the devotion of those who have dedicated their lives to the Lord. So... Thank you very much for allowing us to be here, Maharaj. And with your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. So, these seven purposes. I'm actually wondering, because I know that the, the hosts, if you can give me permission to share my screen, I won't share it throughout the whole thing, but I've got three of the seven purposes of ISKCON, which, which are on the slide. And I just want to see if I can actually just share this, maybe just at some points. Okay, thank you for that. I can see that I've got permission. So let me just get to this slide. As I said, I'm only going to share this at some points, but just to begin, I think it would be useful um, for us to see this. So Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, who is predicted in different places in Shastra, he came to the West, Marge was explaining this point, before he came in 1965, instituted ISKCON. Let me see if my notes are correct. And Marge, feel free to correct me. In 1966, July 1966, the incorporation of ISKCON. So these seven purposes of ISKCON are essential for us to know, to understand, and also to reflect on for a number of reasons. And one of the things we'd like to do as we go through the session 
is really to, is really try to understand more about why it is so important for us to know and reflect on this. And actually, what I'm what I'm tempted to do, and what I will do, even just initially, is and I may do this do this at other points in the session, is draw some of us into the conversation. And I'll just explain why we're doing this or why we're taking this approach. There's a real understanding, uh, and this is increasingly being understood in the modern world, but this is also very deeply understood within our own tradition, that the knowledge is not meant to be a passive affair. Okay, I repeat that. The knowledge is not meant to be a passive affair. Knowledge, if it's properly understood, is meant to be a transformative affair. And there is some research on this which suggests that we tend to remember about 70% of, of what we discuss, 80% of what we experience, and 90 to 95% of what we share or what we teach. Okay, so in, in the process of interacting with the teaching, in the processing of, of discussing, as Marge said, you know, having that discussion, discussion is the first stage. Uh, what is it that Krishna said? Machita madgata prana bodhiyanta prasparam kathayanticha mamnityam tusyanticha ramanticha. The devotees, my devotees are experiencing great bliss and satisfaction from always enlivening or discussing about me. So as we discuss, as we interact, it actually does something to our consciousness. As we start to do this, we go through the four stages. Shravana, we're hearing. Manana, we're reflecting on what we're hearing. Nididhyasan, we're starting to have some conception of how this applies to me. Okay. And then um, one of our acharyas, maybe Baladev Vijayabhushan, but I can't remember clearly, he also adds a fourth level, which is Vandana. So there's also prayer. And these stages make the knowledge transformative. Um, Chanamali Marjan, obviously, and my spiritual master, they were very close friends for many years, so he'll know this better than, than I do. But I do recall one of the, one of the disappointments of Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, was he wasn't seeing enough devotees change. So there was a real emphasis on transformation, a real emphasis on taking the teachings from here to here. And as, as John Moy Marsh said so nicely in the previous presentation, that the example is so powerful. I'll add to that, the example is so powerful, so necessary, and so fulfilling. So what we're going to do in this session today, as we discuss, and we'll discuss three of these seven principles today, we'll discuss the other four tomorrow. I'd also like us to do some type of introspection as we go through the, as we go through the three of the seven principles this week and um, today. What we'll do is we'll discuss them, but I'd also like to, you to think about your own consciousness and your own life in relation to these principles or purposes, okay? How am I expressing or imbibing this purpose of ISKCON in my own life? So in, in what I do for a living, I'm a leadership um, consultant. So I train leaders uh, globally. And one of the things that we're constantly doing in the training is getting them to do an evaluation. And actually, I was just listening to a class the other day by Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj, and he was talking about the fact that in scripture, one of the points which are made about doing things or doing sudden or well is counting. So whenever there's some kind of evaluation against the principle of Shastra, then we understand where we are, we understand where we could be, and we gain the impetus to keep moving forward. Okay, so... Just, set, just pulling this up front so it will be interactive. We're going to ask everyone to make notes also. Whatever resonates for you, whatever stands out in your mind as we're going through the session, make some notes. And the, connect, and the connection or the meditation is specific. As we hear different things, ask yourself the question, what does this mean for me in my spiritual life? Okay, what are my reflections on this? All of my insights on this, how could I apply this or how could I apply this better in my own spiritual life? And by doing so, the process will become more transformative because it will also become more personal. I remember years ago hearing one class 
and it was a Prabhupada disciple making the point that in ISKCON the difficulty is we, have, we hear too many classes. And he didn't mean that there were too many classes. What he meant was that we don't digest what we've heard. So we've all had this experience. We may hear something again and again, and we start to, we start to be desensitized to it. But we want to go in the opposite direction. We want to make everything more personal. Prabhupada's seven purposes of ISKCON, we want to make them more personal to us, to our lives, and to see what can I be doing in each of these particular areas. Now, before we get into all of these, there's one other thing I want to bring up. So when, when Chan Mui Maharaj reached out to me, you know, he, asked, he very kindly invited me to the disciples' retreat, and I asked him, Maharaj, what would be the topic of the retreat? And he, he said the topic of the retreat will be Srila Prabhupada, the glorification of Srila Prabhupada. So then within that, that banner, we could discuss anything we want. And, and what, what I thought could be very useful as a precursor to, to the discussion is to understand the science of glorification. Because we often hear we, do, we glorify the Lord, we glorify the devotees, but there's also something that happens within the individual who engages in that glorification. Glorification is also a process of transformation itself. And its opposite, criticism, is also a process of transformation, but in the opposite direction. So I'll just, we'll just read a few things and then we'll go from there. I'll just read you this. This is actually, this is from a class by Prabhupada on the Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, Chapter 5, Text Number 23. This class was given in Vrindavan, August the 4th, 1974. This is a quote. Prabhupada says, this is the business of the disciple. How to glorify the spiritual master, Parampara. I glorify my spiritual master. You glorify your spiritual master. If we simply do that, glorify, then Krishna is glorified. Now, this is, this is very interesting. Glorification. Uh, the... Um, the Upadesh Amrita, nature of instruction begins, Vacho Vegam Manasa Krodha Vegam, Jiva Vegam Uttara Pasta Vegam, Etam Vegam Yofvishaheta Dira, Savam Apimam Pripavim Shishishyat. So he's explaining about this controlling the urges, the tongue, belly, the genitals. So the tongue is the first in that particular line. How the tongue is used, what, what the tongue comes into contact with by way of food, how the tongue vibrates has a, it has a huge and transformative effect on the individual. So we're coming together to glorify Ashila Prabhupada. Marj has already beautifully done so in speaking about the Gita Nagari prophecy. We'll speak a little bit about these seven purposes. But what's happening when we glorify someone is very important. There is, um, there is such a thing as chakra psychology. So we know in the Vedas, it talks about many things because the Vedic culture and the sources of Vedic knowledge were both the Lord himself ultimately, but also elevated, very pure devotees. They had not only access to gross physical knowledge, which we see in the modern society, but they also had access to subtle and spiritual perception. So they could understand very many subtle aspects of reality that in our modern society, we, we're, we're even question if, questioning if such things exist. But to those who have the perception, those who have the level of consciousness, these things are a, a lived experience. I'll, I'm going to be very honest with you because I always like to connect things very honestly. So I was speaking to one devotee recently. And I could see, and we had quite a few conversations over the last, I don't know, however many years, I've known him many years. And I could see that subtly, subtly, there was some kind of erosion of faith. And, and just, you know, recently, his whole conversation was around, yeah, you know, whether Krishna exists or not, I can, I can see that this is true, and I want to be very authentic. And the idea behind that is that, you know, well, I, I don't want to believe something just because it's written in a book. And it was very instructive for me because to be honest, some of the things that he felt were theoretical and just written in a book, I know other devotees who've directly experienced those realities. I know other devotees 
who directly experienced those realities. So what I could see had happened is misapplication of the teaching. Marge spoke a bit earlier about, and this is one of the first things we'll look at in, in terms of the seven purposes. Marge spoke about how Prabhupada is giving this teaching, why? To correct the imbalances, right? In the values of human society. So it's really a teaching to be relished and to be experienced. The whole idea of Prabhupada's mission was to transform society in transforming the individuals in that society and to transform them by transforming their consciousness. And by transforming their consciousness or how to transform their consciousness by connecting them once again with their original identity and connecting them with the source of everything, the source of their original identity, which is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the reason why we want to take this approach about interacting together is because it occurred to me that if we don't, if we don't change the way that we approach spiritual life, we will also become that individual. We will also become that individual where it's kind of just a nice philosophical idea at one point, then also, and this is what tends to happen, it's a nice philosophical idea which I haven't experienced. That's one point. Point number two, I'm having some conflict with devotees or something about the devotees, it jars with my present understanding. And then I start to make this subtle, subtle and then gross retreat from spiritual life. So one of the processes of transformation is glorification. Right? And, I, and I repeat that. One of the processes of transforming ourselves is inherently connected to the glorification of, of great devotees, especially Shri Prabhupada. So what happens? So because of the, the subtle and spiritual perception of pure devotees, um, which is also explained in the, by the Goswamis, they say that the source of all Shastra, it, they, they call it Vyuha Pratyaksha, the direct perception of self-realized souls. Yeah. So they can see it. Brahma Samhita is an example. Ishvara Paramakrishna Satchidananda Vigraha. Lord Brahma is explaining what he's actually seeing. He, he's, he's conveying his, his direct realization. So when one is purified, this more and more we have these experiences. So in our culture, our spiritual culture, these great personalities can see. So they could also see chakras. They could also see subtle aspects of reality. There's one chakra called the Anahata chakra, which is situated in the heart. So what is, what, what is happening is that when we glorify great devotees, when we glorify devotees in general, a certain degree of that individual's qualities manifest or enter into us right? and in the process of glorification we are also it is also true in the process of criticism when we criticize i actually had the experience of this myself i remember there was a period where i would see people do something and i was just like why do they do that that's just a you know why do they behave that way and it was so interesting because soon after and it's happened on, on repeated occasions soon after having that thought in my mind and i wouldn't even say it then Christian will put me in a position to show me you've got the same mistake, you have the same tendency. And I saw that there was a connection, a connection between this, uh, let's say, lack of glorification, criticism in the mind, and those same qualities developing in oneself. So in the glorification of Srila Prabhupada, in the appreciation of Srila Prabhupada, we are also growing closer to Srila Prabhupada. Right? That's the point to bear in mind. So let's start with this. Let's start with this point. So in the seven purposes of ISKCON, the first one, I'll just read it to you actually, is this, to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and to educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the world. So actually, one thing is I, I think, I just want to check if, if you can hear me clearly, or if I should, just let me know. Can you hear me? Okay, I, let me stop the video, 
and just let me know is that better can you hear me more clearly Lavanya you could yes, you yes. could just message in the um, chat yes. Yes, brother, is that better yes 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 definitely thank you okay no worries thank you okay <laughs> so let's see how we go with this all right so there's a lot in this first purpose to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge when you hear memories of Prabhupada's by Prabhupada's disciples, and Marj alluded to this earlier, there's, there's a couple of very outstanding things about Prabhupada. See, Prabhupada, as, as a world acharya, and as an individual who has come directly from the spiritual world, Prabhupada is not just wise in the, in the, in the, in the spiritual sense, not just someone who's philosophical, but actually, we can see in the example of Shura Prabhupada, someone who is wise in literally every respect. Glorious, wise, knowledgeable in literally every single respect, every single way that one could be wise. So on a worldly sense, he knew exactly what was going on. He knew how to deal with people. He knew how to interact with people. He understood where people were coming from. And of course, let's be honest, because of his connection with Krishna, he could really understand people as well. So that's one aspect to bear in mind. Prabhupada had this tremendous ability in so many ways to understand people, understand what was going on, and understand how to create an ISKCON movement that would last beyond him. So this systematic propagation, there's a lot to it. Because for example, there were many pastimes where the movement was being created and there would be different challenges. Devotees faced legal challenges at certain points. There's also a very interesting circumstance where there were some people who were not devotees, but they were advising the devotees. And they were actually advising the devotees as to how to institute the movement in some way legally. And the devotees were being swayed by this. Right? It sounded like it made a lot of sense. They're lawyers, they're giving advice. I was, I was listening to this in the memories, um, in the Matchless Memories, which is a series of pastimes of Prabhupada with Tamal Krishna Maharaj. And, it, and this one always, it always stayed in my mind. So two devotees were in touch with these lawyers. And they were talking about how to legally set up the movement, etc. The devotees mentioned this to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, stop this immediately. Prabhupada wanted the centers to be independent. And the devotees were saying, but these lawyers are saying that if we do it like this, it will help the movement, etc." Prabhupada explained something to them. He said, these two people, he said, these two people, what they want to do is they want you to institute the movement in such a way that they're the only one. I think there's a little bit of background noise. So I'm just gonna ask everyone to make sure they're muted. Okay. So, so there were these two non-devotees giving the advice saying, you've got to set up in this way. The devotees came to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, which this is what we're being told to do. Prabhupada said, don't do it. He said, these people, they want to institute the movement in such a way that they're the only ones who can operate it so they can have control. Very interesting. Prabhupada set up this institution not just for us. He set up the institution literally for the next 10,000 years. There's, a, there's even a, a, a confusion that happens when people read the books, even amongst us as devotees, because when we read the books, sometimes we think, why didn't he put something much more softly? Why didn't he just say it in a way that would appeal to the audience right now? But a careful study of Prabhupada's books will reveal that Prabhupada even some of the things which seem controversial in Prabhupada's books, he's written them on purpose. He's fully aware that that understanding, that understanding has to be written in such a way that for the next 10,000 years, the understanding will not change. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you put something in a way that no one can change it? What you do is you repeat the same key point again and again. That's the first thing. The second thing is you give the philosophy in a way which is so dense that it will not be able to be eroded through the, through the corridors of time. You put it in such a way that it not only will stay true to itself now, 
but over thousands of years, the same teaching, the same knowledge, the same understanding will be given in the same way for future generations. So literally, the books are not even just written for us now. They're written for us, and they're written for human society to go you know, into the future for thousands of years. Yeah? And, in, and now we can take a similar point. The institution has also been set up for that purpose. The institution has also been set up with that time frame in mind. Yeah? One of the things I found most exciting in spiritual life is that as you read, and, and again, Marge alluded to this, Mark made the point yesterday that everything is in the books, and I mean, and, and he, I mean, everything is in the books. It is everything. What happens in Vedic, Vedic knowledge is that some things are given in their full-blown expression. Some things are given in their principal form. Some things are also encoded in the pastimes. So when you unpack the pastimes, then you can see the interactions between personalities, how they respond, how they act. That also is pregnant with meaning. I was, I, was, um, I was reading Surrender Unto Me by Burujan Prabhu. It's his commentary on Bhagavad Gita. There's one place in his commentary, he explains that, you know, there's a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. One of the arguments that Krishna gives to Arjuna, if you leave the battlefield, all these other soldiers, they will think you're a coward. They'll think you've run away. Now, you can look at it on the surface and think, okay, that's a good argument. In Burujan Prabhu's book, he explains, he explains that the way that Krishna spoke to Arjuna, that's how you speak to a Kshatriya. You, you, you communicate in, re, in reference to their pride, you, you, because there's a pride. You know, how will people, you'll be dishonored, right? And for the Kshatriya, well, is it that dishonor is worse than death? If you run away, everyone will think that you're a coward. They won't think you're a Kshatriya, they think you, you're scared. All of these different things. So as you go in, you can unpack this. So anyway, in some sense, I'm jumping because I'm going to go into the books a bit later on. But this point about systematic propagation is important. The way that Prabhupada thought was actually unusual. Prabhupada made this statement. He said that the difference between me and my god brothers is that they think like Indians, I think like an American. Yeah? And I think we've all had an experience of how Americans think, right? So everything is super, super sized, right? Everything is very, very large scale. So this systematic propagation is very important. It's the, the movement is meant, to be, is meant to be delivered in such a way that it can continue. And, and ideally, one of, the, one of the points we can take from this first purpose is that we should try to do our service in such a way that it can continue. Continue, not just continue, but continue to go up in quality and in quantity. In institutions, in businesses, one of the biggest mistakes that they make is that they do, they do nothing on succession planning. So someone does something, they do it well, and everyone just forgets about it. There's no, there's no, there's no forward vision. There's no sense that yes, we're doing well now, what does tomorrow hold? There's no sense of how do we set up success so, so we're successful today and tomorrow we're even more successful. And the day after we're even more successful. But Prabhupada's not like that. Prabhupada is a visionary. I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the real sense of the word, by the way. In the real sense of the word. So in, in the Bhagavatam, there's, um, it, it's very interesting because what happens is when, when Shukadev Goswami is explaining to Maharaj Pariksit, you know, the whole pastimes, what all of these different, all the different knowledge, he's in trance, right? They, and, and, the, and the language that he uses, that it's explained in the different types of, of communication are used. One of the words, that's used, one of the types of communication is called Samadhi Basya. So he's in trance and what's happening is he's seeing the pastimes before him. He's actually seeing it and he's communicating what he's seeing to Marge Pariksit. And Marge Pariksit, he's also in trance. So he's also seeing that same pastimes play out in front of him. And that's actually how the, and that's why 
he's as they're seeing all these details are coming up. Mother showed that her hair's like this, she's doing this, etc. Because it's being perceived. Same thing with our Mickey. Ramayan, same thing. So we can understand also that the pure devotee is what? Trikalagya. Visionary in the real sense, meaning that they can see past, they can see present, and they can also see the future. They can also see the future. And then with that, with that perspective, with that perspective, they then make their plans and propagate and set their movement in, in accord with that 360 vision, with that full understanding of where we are, where we've come from, and where we need to go. So what, this is what we mean by visionary. Prabhupada is a visionary, and he has that ability. And there are many statements where Prabhupada would predict what will happen in the future. There are statements in the Bhagavatam which predicts the future as Kali Yuga progresses, what will happen, how people will become more and more basically animalistic. You know, and how the, how the, the entire world will, will be run by people who have less and less qualification, uh, basically rogues and thieves. Literally to the point that at the end of the Kali Yuga, the person who comes is Kalki. And when Kalki Avatar comes, there's no conversation because no one's qualified. It's just, he just has to kill everyone. Uh, so this systematic propagation is important. But what is he propagating? This statement, to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and to educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life. Now, this is interesting, to propagate spiritual knowledge. We sometimes hear, even from devotees, oh, you know, I'm not so philosophical, you know, I, I, I'm not so into books, I, I'm, I'm more a practical person. Actually, everyone has a philosophy. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or don't believe it, no one on this planet does not have a philosophy. We all have a philosophy. It's just that for the majority of people, the philosophy is unconscious. So philosophy means what? It means I have some kind of understanding or information which I use to determine what I do in life. Okay? That's a philosophy. So Prabhupada understood this. He understood if I change their philosophy, if I change their understanding, everything else will change from there. There's, there's, there's a beautiful statement by Prabhupada. When, and you'll see this again and again. When Prabhupada is talking about people who are living a, a misguided life, he, he will say this classic statement. He will say that they have a poor fund of knowledge. Right? It is due to a poor fund of knowledge. Now, now let's unpack this because our Srila Prabhupada, he, he's a genius. I mean, this person, he's, he's brilliant. If you look at Prabhupada's statement, some of the things he said, it's like a sutra. It's, a, it's one small statement. When you dig into it, it's just, it just gives and gives and gives. This statement, poor fund of knowledge, what it means is whenever we go about our day-to-day -day life, every object that we come into contact with, every person that we come into contact with, we don't just see the individual. We see the individual and we have some idea associated with the individual. You see, when, when someone's a baby, what happens? They don't have knowledge. So, what, so the, when they look at anything, the child is in the animal stage of consciousness. So everything is just food to the child. There's no knowledge, so everything just becomes one thing, food. So you'll see, it's your money they put in their mouth. It's your shoes they put in their mouth. Whatever it is, they put in their mouth. When we are adults, we have some conception that connects with every single item. And that knowledge that we associate with a particular item determines how we deal with it. Very simple example, fire. We all have a very clear concept of fire. That fire, if I put my hand in it, it's going to burn me. So, so when people are around fire, they're immediately careful. Because related to this event or phenomena called fire is caution, care, you know, to be, you know, to really take it seriously. So in a similar way, when we propagate or when we connect with this systematic knowledge, when we connect with spiritual knowledge, a subtle transformation is taking place. 
And that is, we're recalibrating, and, and really pay, pay attention to this, we're recalibrating our understanding to make sure that our understanding of something is accurate. This Krishna consciousness movement, Prabhupada says, will go down in history as being the movement that saved the entire world. Isn't that amazing? Right? Now the question is how? How? The, all the issues that we see in modern society is due to a poor fund of knowledge. And, and there's three types in that we, well, we can categorize it in three ways. Ignorance, passion, goodness. Because our society, and Prabhupada wrote this when in, his, in his prayers when he was coming to the West, he says this society, they're steeped in passion and ignorance. So what happens is we will do things, we will look at something, we will, we will, we will bring a certain conception to it or a certain idea to it, which looks wonderful in the short term. But in the long term, can cause so much damage. This point, I was listening to Marge's class earlier, and this point relates even to Varnashram. This conception that anyone can do everything and anything, and it's all fine. Many people have bought into that concept. It's funny, you look at the most rich people on the planet right now, hardly any of them have got an MBA. Right, a master's in business administration. They did that ability to make money, they didn't learn it at school. Those people who are very, very wealthy, very rich, the vast majority of them, they had that nature. They were born that particular way. Right? And you know, the funny thing is, even they don't know that that's why they're successful. So then they'll go on TV and they'll have this big course and they'll tell you how I made my first million. And if you go on my course, I can teach you. If I did it, anyone can do it. But that's not our understanding. Our understanding is that they had that particular nature from birth. So it's so amazing. You can have someone who's good at something, someone who's, who's claiming who, who, who the world looks up to, they're successful, and they're telling you the, the reason that for their success was this technique, and they really believe it. They really believe it. That's why they're so convincing. They really believe it's because of my techniques. It, it's, but it's behind their own level of perception to understand, no, you're born with that particular nature. So we can misperceive. We can easily misperceive. Prabhupada's books and this spiritual education was to give people a proper understanding of everything. Not just, not, not just so-called spiritual things. Prabhupada's books are actually designed to give people a proper understanding of literally everything. It's so amazing. I was, um, there's, there's this class by Tamal Krishnamaraj, well, it's not class, it's just a snippet. And he says something in there, which I, I, I thought, okay, that's nice. And I've heard something like this before, but I didn't really understand it. He's talking about devotees getting up before Mangalati. He's talking about devotees getting up at Brahma Mahorata. And he says, if you don't get up before, before Mangalati and chant your rounds, I cannot guarantee that you'll get a taste for chanting, right? And you can look at it and think, oh, that's nice, right? Yes, that's nice. But Brahma Hurta, why the significance? So I started researching this. At the Brahma Mahurta, and this is again spiritual knowledge which is thousands of years old. At Brahma Mahurta, your your conscious mind and your unconscious mind are actually more open. So when you do activities, when you do spiritual activities at the Brahma Mahurta, it actually, it actually creates a samskara at a much deeper level of consciousness. You can literally change your psychology by doing your japa at Brahma Mahurta. Can you believe that? Now this, now this kind of knowledge, it's so subtle that you can't see it. You see, it's not gross knowledge, which is what our modern society um, kind of pretends to be so great because they've got this gross knowledge. All of these things are subtle knowledge. So what Prabhupada has given, he's giving us an insight into things that we can only see when we are at a very exalted level of consciousness. And that's also why there's an argument that we see in society. 
we see it within our society we see it outside of our society because different people will see things see the same thing according to a level of consciousness so people are arguing because let's say i'm in the mode of ignorance i'm looking at something and i think it's a bad idea you're you're in the mode of passion you're looking at the same thing and you think it's okay someone else is in the mode of goodness and they have a different perception but we're all looking at the same thing right? so what does this education do this education and the, and as it says not just that to educate people all people in the techniques of spiritual life what it does is it starts to attune us to higher levels of spiritual consciousness and at higher levels of spiritual consciousness we can all see the same thing it's a it's so it's so practical there's an increasing issue around mental illness and you go online you you go on whatever platform you'll see all these courses books articles everything you know mental health mental health mental health no one has made the connection that the reason for the mental illness is also to do with technology and unnatural lifestyles it's not occurred to anyone you're sitting in front of this computer screen all day and when you're not sitting in front of the computer screen you're looking at your screen on your on your on your mobile phone and in ayurveda it's, it's very clearly understood that when you do this the vata increases in the body you'll become more in your head and you become less grounded no? and all of these things lead to issues so where we are literally like that blind person that Prabhupada talked about the West is like the blind man. India is like the lame man. So one, so the, the deep spiritual culture has the eyes. It can see what is not obvious. The Western culture has the systems, the technology, the mass, the mass communication, the mass book distribution, whatever it is. They have this, this machinery. So what Prabhupada has done in this first purpose, he's brought them together systematically propagate that means you use all the technologies for mass distribution you use all the means of systematic continuous propagation to do what to bring a process and an understanding that will give people eyes that will give people the clear ability to see in in a real sense not speculative but the real sense okay this is what i'm dealing with and this is the effect of what I'm dealing with. It's so amazing that you'll see in the lives of devotees, when they really have proper spiritual knowledge, when it's delivered to them in the proper way, by qualified personalities such as Chanamuya Maharaj, then what happens is what, the, what that exalted person can see, everyone else starts to be able to see the same thing. And then it's no longer a question of whether you believe in it or not. It's like, no, you can see it. I remember Radha Bhakti gave a brilliant seminar on male female psychology. And, and to be honest, to this day, there are many people, it's a contentious issue, right? It's a contentious issue. Are men and women different? But actually, if you have the Vedic knowledge, it's very obvious. It's very obvious. Right? Of course, the differences, the Vedas are very powerful like this. And this is why Prabhupada's giving his books, his spiritual education, they don't just give, they give three things actually Prabhupada's books give three things they give the sambanda they give the context or the situation they give the abhideya as is spoken of here the practice the spiritual technique but they also give the prayojana they give the goal and and what happens in modern society is people do things without understanding the outcomes so even well-intentioned people can cause havoc when Prabhupada's books talk about differences, different types of bodies, think about it carefully. If you're part of a, of, a, of a society which is very elevated, let's say very sattvic, and you hear that this group have strength in this area, but they're not strong in this area. And this group, they have strengths in this area, but they're not strong in this area. Now, if I'm in the mode of ignorance and I find out that you're, you're not good in a certain area, in the mode of ignorance, I can neglect you right it's not because of the knowledge it's because i'm in the mode of ignorance so i use the knowledge to neglect you because i'm in the mode of ignorance 
If I have the same knowledge and I'm in the mode of passion, again, the same knowledge, but now because I'm in the mode of passion, I exploit you. So I found out from scripture that you're good at this and you're not so strong in this area. But because I'm in the mode of passion, I use the fact that you're not good in a particular area to exploit you. Now, let's go to the third level. A culture in the mode of goodness. I read something, I find out you're strong in this area, you're not strong in this area. If I'm in the mode of goodness, what, what is my reaction to the, to the fact that you're not strong in a particular area? What would I do? Just put the answer in the chat window. In the mode of goodness, when you find out someone is strong in one area, they're not strong in another area, what do you do? How do you respond? Any answers? In the mode of goodness, when you find exactly, Dipti, yes, yeah, support them. So this is, see, this is a point. So these books and this systematic propagation, it's also about values. We are different. There are differences in the condition, in the condition sense, right? That's what, what we mean by Varnashram. It's not a problem. The problem is the mode of consciousness that someone is in. If I'm in a higher mode, that's not an issue. That, the fact that you're strong in one area, then we'll leverage that. The fact that you're not strong in another area, I'm going to support you because if you're weak in an area that I'm strong, let's come together. And we can even appreciate each other because I can appreciate what you're bringing. You can appreciate what I bring. We have community. So we have to grow up. We have to grow up. The, we are conditioned, well, not all of us, but many of us, we have a conditioned nature. So there are differences that we cannot get around. The question is, what do we do with the differences? They're a reality. So Prabhupada has given this understanding for us to know what to do. And he says it, to educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life. This imbalance of values is the lower modes, is the exploitation consciousness, the neglectful consciousness. And he says to achieve real unity and peace in the world. Again, very powerful point that came up earlier. And this happens on the macrocosm and on the microcosm. If I build my life on something that's untrue, eventually it will fall apart. Okay? If I build my life on something that's true, it has stability. Right? How do we know this? Because it's inherent in our teachings. The mode of ignorance is what? It is, has inertia, the quality of inertia, the quality of decay, destruction. The mode of passion, it begins like Nectar Krishna says, and ends like poison. So passion is also hyperactive, it's chaotic. The mode of goodness, who looks after the mode of goodness? Vishnu, who is Vishnu? He's the maintainer. The mode of goodness has the quality of maintenance. So when things are done in the sattvic mode, they tend to be more stable, they tend to last. Unfortunately, therefore, we have a global society which is built on passion and ignorance. A global society built on passion and ignorance. Therefore, there's so much issue. There's so many issues. And unfortunately, people don't even know what's causing the issue. So Prabhupada, the, the, Prabhupada's books are like X-ray X -ray vision. Through the books, you look, you can see everything. Not only can you see the different elements, you can see the relationships that they have between themselves and how they're meant to be related. And that allows us to inform our decisions to navigate life in such a way, in such a way that we can achieve the ultimate goal of life. Huh? So this, this first purpose is absolutely crucial. To, unfortunately, let's just be very honest, this idea of achieving real unity and peace, it cannot happen unless it happens on a platform which is higher than the way we're living now. It has to be done on a platform of truth. So what is the truth? What is the actual, what is the actual siddhanta? What is the actual reality that we're living in? Who am I? Who is the other person? What is this material energy? I was, um, when I was studying this, um, when I was studying the Bhagavatam, it was very interesting. One of the things that 
I was learning about the third canto of Bhagavatam. Throughout the Bhagavatam, there's so many times where the creation is explained. So there's ten, there's ten topics in Bhagavatam, right? Saga, Vishaga, um, Stanam, Poshnam, you know, there's ten topics. So one of the points that comes up again and again in the Bhagavatam is the creation. And it's explained on more than one, it's explained more than once. It's ex and there's a reason that's given as to why it's explained. Because the, the point that's trying to be brought about is to understand that this creation is Krishna's energy. He's involved in the creation through his energies and the creation cannot be understood separately from the Lord. The whole idea of material science is that we can, we can, we can improve on, on God, right? So yeah, nature's done one way, but I know better. We can tweak it like this. We can tweak it like that. But in, in so-called improvement, they create another 10 issues, right? And then you, get, you take a drug to fix that issue and that creates another five issues. Then you have to take another drug for the side effects of those other five issues and that creates even more issues. It's literally the opposite of Krishna's system. Krishna's system is simple yet sophisticated, right? Think about that. Three colors, just three primary colors, yellow, red, blue. All the other colors in the spectrum come from the three colors, just three. Three modes of material nature, sattva, um, sattva, tamas, rajas. From the three modes, all the other material objects are created. Three doshas, right? Vata, pitta, kapha. From the three doshas, all the different bodies. Simple yet incredibly sophisticated. It's an incredible system. And this propagation, this spiritual knowledge, it will bring the unity because it will allow people to see for themselves exactly what the situation is and what they should do. So this is the first of these seven points in terms of how we propagate or the need to propagate systematically this knowledge. And one more thing I'll say about this systematic propagation. It has to be systematic because the avidya is also systematic. There's a systematic propagation of ignorance. So just, you know, doing one or two, you know, having your one-off program here and there, that does, it's not going to cut it. When you have a systematic propagation of a vidya, the only way to deal with it is to have the opposite, a systematic propagation of the spiritual science. That's the only hope. It can't be chaotic. It can't be piecemeal. It, it has to be systematic. Therefore, the Sankirtan mission. Therefore, Prabhupada, the printing press. Therefore, BBT. Huh? Therefore, Prabhupada even making sure when you, when, you, when, you, when you do the posters, when you do the books, make sure that my name is there. And it should say, His Divine Grace, Shula, um, Founder Acharya of Iskand Srila Prabhupada, have the whole title. The whole title. Just to make sure that no one can come in and change the teachings, make a claim about someone else being in charge, all of these things. If you do a careful study of Prabhupada's mission, what's amazing, and it is so aligned with the teachings. See, people who are in sattva, they're conscientious. You see that the quality of sattva is things are carefully done, they're done thoughtfully, and they're done in such a way it's stable and, and you know, comprehensive. Prabhupada's not in sattva. He's not in sattva. He's in Vishuddha sattva. So the qualities are there in an even greater extent. Everything is so well thought out, so well planned, so well, well thought through. The, the instructions are given in such a way that everything is carefully aligned, that if it's just followed, if it's just followed, there's guaranteed success. And this is one of the most important things that we should always remember. Prabhupada's mission is, is, a, is a foregone conclusion. It's going to be successful. <laughs> they asked Prabhupada, they asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, when you leave, will your mission, be, uh, will your mission carry on um, because of your disciples? Prabhupada said, the mission will be successful in spite of my disciples. <laughs> he said like that, meaning that it's his own empowerment that makes it work. <laughs> you know, so it's going to happen. But, but, the, but the glory is, the glory is if we follow Prabhupada's instructions, we can get the benefits of being used for, for something that was going to happen anyway. It's so interesting. I went to Vrindavan. 
the first time I went to Vrindavan, 2001, we went through this yatra, different holy places with His Holiness Radha of March. And on one class, I don't recall where we were. He, yes, actually, it's just flashing. We were at the Samadhis. We were visiting, I think it, may, it, would, be, it would have been the Samadhis of some of the Goswamis. I don't recall which one, but I remember now we were there. So, so Radhanath Maharaj was explaining how Prabhupada, there's, there's a report, some, and um, maybe Chandra, Maharaj, Chandra Mali Maharaj will know more. There's some kind of article. And, and Prabhupada, was, he's been, he was interviewed before he came to the West. And in this article, he's talking about how I'm going to the West. There are thousands of temples. I've got thousands of devotees, et cetera, et cetera. And Radhanath Maharaj was, was pointing out the Prabhupada, there was nothing there at the time. He hadn't even gone to the West. There, were, there was no one there. But Prabhupada saw that. He had that vision. This is coming. It's already there. But it's there in its unmanifest form. So this systematic propagation, this is successful. What I want you to do, and I'm going to go on to the next point, what I want you to do is think about this in your own life. Think about this in your own service. Think about this in terms of how you are doing your service in such a way that not only does it last or continue, how are we in the services that we do, how are we making sure that it becomes greater, it continues, it expands, it grows. Now, it could be in different ways. For some of us, it could be, am I, do I have a successor? The things that I'm doing, the things that I'm learning, am I training up other devotees to also take on those services? That could be one way. Another thing could be the systems that we're using to propagate Krishna consciousness. Am I creating systems and programs that work now? And am I also thinking about what's about the future? How to take this a step further? Am I having those conversations? Am I doing that meditation? This systematic propagation, how, how, is, it, how is it manifesting in my life? And then the last one, in relation to this same point, this point about the techniques in spiritual life in order to check the imbalances of values in life. How am I also imbibing this? How am I aligning my values to the teachings in the books? Do I understand why this needs to be done? I'll be honest with you. I know some devotees, this last 12 months, to be honest with you, even though we've been in lockdown, they've had some of the best times of their entire life. Now the question becomes why? One of the reasons is that in many cases, their life was not so much co connected to, or let's say not connected to, not dependent upon the externals. Now think about that. One of the things we teach managers, we, we're often talking about change, right? Because in the world, everything, they, they want things to be done faster, bigger, you know, newer. There's always some new program. So they're often in the material world talking about how to, how to, they call it disruption, right? How do we disrupt our industry? How do we make it the new innovation, the new idea that's going to make our company more money? So we're often talking to managers about how to manage change. If someone has a higher consciousness, they're much more fluid to change. Why? Because their consciousness is not attached so much to the externals. They're able to use things if they need to, but they're not dependent on externals. So if something changes, they can function. And the biggest, and this is really important, the biggest thing, the biggest factor here is the internal consciousness. I was gonna, I was gonna give, um, I, I might still do it. I was gonna give a presentation called The Economics of Kirtan. And the idea behind the presentation is that, yes, in modern society, we're talking about the environmental crisis, we're talking about we have to change patterns of consumption, but, the, but, but no one's being honest. Because think about it now. If people are, if people are unhappy, your day-to-day -day life, you're actually unhappy. And then what you do, therefore, is you watch lots of movies, you play lots of games, because you want to forget how unhappy you are. Okay? You buy lots of different products because you want to forget how unhappy you are. You eat lots of junk food because you want to forget how unhappy you are. Now, we have this ecological crisis and you're going to suddenly tell people, okay, we're going to have to stop creating all, these, all this wasteful technology, 
we have to stop throwing these things away because we're destroying the planet. But the reason why you take these things in the first place is because you're unhappy. Unless you give people an alternative that actually gives them some inner fulfillment, they will not be able to let go of so much external gratification. In other words, param drisva nivatate. There must be a higher taste. You can't just take the toys away from the baby and say, you know, survive. It doesn't work that way. So Prabhupada, this is a point. This, there's a whole flow here. Systematic propagation, one point. Propagating what? Spiritual knowledge, a, a second point. But not just knowledge. Spiritual knowledge of what? Of, of techniques. You're giving the techniques in spiritual life, okay? So the knowledge of the practice. But for what purpose? To check the imbalance of values. So you know the knowledge is working when the values align with spiritual values. There's a litmus test here. And what is it meant to do? If it's working, then there's an inner experience. He says here, real unity and peace in the world. Now, we, that's a microcosm. You could then bring it down to your own life. Real unity, most people are fragmented. You may have seen that. In many people, they're fragmented. They're kind of like, you know, there's something going on. I, I'm kind of pulled between different desires. Um, they, there's not a real integration in the individual. And most people are not peaceful. So as within, so without. I'm going to go around telling people that we want, we want to make society peaceful, but, my, but in my own consciousness, I'm disturbed. Is that going to work? I'm going to tell people that we want people to be in harmony, but I've, I've got disharmony within myself. Is that going to work? I, I was working in, in, I was working in, in a, a, a management consultancy and I hated it. I hated it. <laughs> it, was it was a terrible job. I hated it. And what happened was, and what the manager I had at the time, he was just, he was just driving me crazy. Okay. And, and he was, he was Indian, right? And the reason why I'm, I'm telling you why I'm saying that, the re it's not because of racial thing, it's because he'd gone to, in the company, he'd gone to a talk. There was a group, I think, the South Asian Society. And we were together one day, and he said to me, he said, Ed, he said, you know, he said that there's a, there's a reason why you and I are together. That's what he told me. And I thought, really, what are you talking about? Right? Then he went on, then he said to me, he said, you know, a year ago, I went to a talk at the Salvation Society, and there was this guy who was giving the talk, and he was really interesting, and I bought his book, and he said that the guy who, who, who gave the talk, I was reading his book, and he was talking about this whole journey he went on from when he was young, and he went traveling around the world and traveling through India, and it's a really good book, and he said, and he said to me, he said, on Sunday, he said, I read it, he said, on Sunday, I like to just lay in the bath and read the book, and he said, you know, the book's cool. He said, it's a really good book. You, you might really like it. And he said, the book is called The Journey Home. Yeah, he told me that. He said, the book is called The Journey Home. And I said, yeah. I, said I know the person who wrote that book. Yeah. And he, this, he's not a devotee at all. He, but he said to me, he said, there's a reason why you and I are working together. And even he didn't know the reason. But, but the knowledge gives that kind of understanding. The knowledge will give that kind of understanding. It will not just give the understanding. And Chan Mui Maharaj mentioned this, Maharaj mentioned this yesterday. The Bhagavatam is Grant Avatar, right? It is the literary incarnation of the Lord. And as Maharaj explained, one of the questions that was, that, that's, that's posed in the Bhagavatam is where did religious principles take shelter when Krishna left the planet? And it's explained in that same Bhagavatam, they've taken shelter in the Bhagavatam the literary incarnation of the Lord. Right? So the truth of the matter is we don't take advantage of what we've been given. We really don't take it because, because in one sense, we don't really understand what we've been given. And, and, and it's understandable. The modern world is like this. If, if people make a big fuss of something, everyone will think it's wonderful, even if there's nothing there, right? Because in the modern world, it's all about the packaging. If you have a lot of packaging around something and there's very little substance, but the packaging is good, it's got a hype, everyone's talking about it, everyone's like, my God, it must be good. Our culture is in some sense opposite. What's being given is something extremely valuable, but it's not, it doesn't come with all the hype. 
it doesn't always come with all the packaging. So therefore, for people in Kali Yuga, in ignorance and passion, who, who, who are attuned to the external, that's what, that's what passion does. Passion means we become attuned to what the external packaging is, and we, we don't even notice what's inside it. Therefore, we're more attuned to the packaging than to the substance, unfortunately. Yeah. But Prabhupada's teachings are for the purpose of changing that. Yeah. Prabhupada's teachings are for the purpose of changing that. But it requires something of us. It requires us to be a bit deeper and to try to understand what we've been given by connecting with Prabhupada's teachings. And just as Prabhupada is talking about the systematic propagation, I would say also that there should be the systematic connection on our part. We need to systematically connect with everything that Prabhupada has given us. Right? So you can consider the propagation has two di dimensions. It has an outward dimension, and that systematic propagation also has an internal dimension. That means everyday reading, everyday chanting, everyday association, systematic. I, I was studying, I was, I'm just so excited about some of the things that um, I've been reading about. I was thinking about doing something on what we call samskar psychology. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So, I can't remember, it, I think it's from Patanjali for Sadhana to be successful. And he gives corruption and it has to be done with, so you do something uninterrupted, for deep impression on the consciousness. So the same thing with the teachings, you do it here and there, you don't get the full effect. You don't get the full effect. You do it consistently, then the full effect comes. I'm just gonna pause and see, can you still hear me? Because everyone's frozen on my screen. So feel free to just let me know if you can still hear me before I carry on. We can hear you, Prabhuji, but in the middle... So you can uh, just video. send something in the chat window. Sure. Okay. So, shall I continue? Can you hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Okay. But what I was just saying is that systematic propagation, you can consider it to be external and to be internal. Okay? So, the systematic propagation is also... The systematic propagation of Krishna consciousness within our own can really move forward in spiritual life. Okay, what I'm going to do is in part two, I'll actually I'll cover the other the other um, the other purposes. I think I should stop now and just ask if there are any questions. All right, we should have this so I'm just going to ask if there are any questions. So we have a few questions here. Um, if it's okay with you, can, can sh should we take a couple of questions? Um, an answer? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, 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 yeah, um, this um, kirtan is scheduled in about 15 minutes, but I found out that they're going to do kirtan for an hour and a half, so you can push the questions and answers beyond the beyond the time. Okay. So uh, the kirtan can start oh, later because it'll, it'll go for an hour and a half. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, so with your permission, Buddha Baba and Prabhu. Uh, just proceed uh, asking the questions. I can't hear anyone. Okay. Oh. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. So we have a few questions. So the first question is from Devananda Pandit Prabhu. Uh, so I just wanted to ask Devananda Pandit Prabhu, would you like to ask the question, unmute and ask the question yourself? Please read the question. Okay. I'll read the question for you. Thank you, Prabhu. So Prabhu's question is, do you think Srila Prabhupada would be pleased if he knew that I changed, I think he may need mean interpreted, 
ISKCON's first purpose in this way, to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to all the members of my family and to educate all of them in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the family. I would answer like this. I don't think you need to change it to include that because it says, for, it says here to educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life. So your family is included. So I would just say like that, it's not a problem. So I wouldn't lose, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. We keep it, we will keep it as it is, but it includes family members. But there is also a serious point to that. And that is we all have different fields of influence. Okay, so what I would, what I would add to that is, and again, Marge touched upon this. You see, the difficulty is sometimes we see there's so much to be done in spreading Krishna consciousness. There's a huge amount to be done. But we sometimes think that because there's a huge amount to be done, we then go into the mode of passion and we, do every, we try and do anything and everything. That's not, that's not intelligent, right? So we should try to see within, within the wider remit to spread Krishna consciousness, what can I, how, can I, how can I best do this? You know, look at your skills. And Marge put this very nicely. You sometimes have people who can't lead and they can't do management and they're in positions of management. And they'll tell you, yes, Prabhupada said we should spread the movement. Yeah, but is this the best way for you to spread the movement? You may be much better placed doing this kind of service. You see? So there is, there is a step. It's because we're impersonal. But it's a form of impersonalism. Therefore, there's everything needs to be done and we just jump in. Now, there is an exception. And Marge also mentioned that when we have limited resources and we do the needful. Okay. If there's no one on hand, we do the needful. But when there's opportunity, we should use our intelligence, our Krishna-given intelligence, to see how can I best serve, you know? And if we do that, then we can really make a difference. I'm going to switch off my camera just so I can hopefully help the audio, okay? That can really make a difference if we use our intelligence in that way. So I would answer in that particular way. And Anantacharya, maybe you can take it to the next question. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. So the next question is from Tushar Prabhu. Tushar Prabhu, would you like to ask a question? Or would you like me to read it for you? Hare Krishna, Ananta Prabhu. Uh, just if you can read it, that's fine too. Thank you. Tushar Prabhu says, such a deep and thoughtful class. When you talk about systematic propagation of Srila Prabhupada's books, but at the same time, we are constantly steeped in mode of passion and ignorance. How can we discern what is the right thing to do at the right time? If we are not in mode of goodness, do we step out of that situation or seek guidance from our spiritual master who is fixed in mode of goodness? Is that our compass here? Absolutely. The, the, the absolute answer is, if we're following the pro process properly, see, it's like this. If we're sincere, then we should follow. If we're able to follow, what does that mean? It means that even if I think I have an idea, I will always talk to my seniors. And by seniors, I mean those people who are, are, are advanced devotees. And by doing so, all kinds of amazing things happen. I, I've seen this in my own life. And this is part of the methodology of the Bhagavatam. That's that, I mentioned this before. First canto, it gives what, what is called Adhikari Tattva. So you see this in the exchanges between hearer and speaker. So we, we, we've lost this culture, unfortunately. But if, you're, if you approach people who are more realized and you approach them in the mood of respect and humility, it's not just, there's a huge, there's a huge blessing that's given. It's not just what they're telling you. It's also the association and the consciousness that they have. So, so many subtle things are being transmitted, which also transform us as individuals, you know? So it's really, really important that we have that proper culture of dealing with each other and especially advanced devotees in a cultured and, and respectful way. It is, it's like magic. I've seen this in my own life. If we deal with these advanced devotees properly, it literally changes us. And if we don't, 
then then we start to go into that category where we become those devotees who think that the process doesn't work it works it's just that we don't apply it properly you see whenever whenever anything doesn't work in life there's two options one is the actual thing doesn't work or option two it does work but it's been not it's not been applied properly right so you can have a technique and that you're, you're trying to achieve something okay it didn't work out is it because the technique doesn't work or is it because i used the technique in the wrong way so the same thing in spiritual life it works but it works if it's applied properly now it's so powerful that if it's misapplied you still get something but if you want the real and full effect, you have to do it properly. Yeah? And that's how, it, that's how it works. So we should always seek the association of, of those who are more advanced than us. It is literally the game changer. I was reading, when I was studying Bhagavatam, I was reading about the reason why Bharat Maharaj fell down. So Bharat Maharaj, he's at, he's at Bhava Bhakti. And there are different reasons given by the Acharya as to why he fell down. One of them is that he did not have association. And it's explained by the Acharis that that's why in his next life, when he became a deer, he came back to, to, to be in the place where, the, uh, where there were other devotees, other spiritualists, because he remembered that, that issue. So he, he deliberately made sure that in the next life, he, was still in a, he, he remained in association. So all of these things are important. And especially as we progress in spiritual life, association becomes more important, not less because it becomes more subtle. So the progress is more subtle. So it has to be a more refined practice, more refined guidance. And I'll be very honest with you, and I've seen this in experience, the association we have, have and have had of advanced devotees, they can see all kinds of aspects of our, of our consciousness. So it's not that their vision and our vision is the same. That's not true. Because the vision of someone in higher consciousness, the perception of someone in higher consciousness is different to the perception of someone in lower consciousness. It's a fact, right? And anyone who, who sincerely practices and who takes association, they'll be able to see it. it it's, it's incredible. So if we just take advantage with humility, that's the qualification, by the way, between the hearer and the speaker, the Adhikari Tattva is also, it's a, that it's the dynamic of being able to hear from authority and being able to inquire from authority and inquiring sincerely to get a clear understanding, but to get a clear understanding with a submissive mood. You can come to the same individual and have a mood that you want to just defeat them, or you, you want to you want them to you want them to, to do what you want. And what will happen is it will corrupt the transmission. Because what will happen is that the Krishna in the heart sees you don't, you're not looking for the truth, you're looking for something else. There's um, it's, it's a beautiful thing that there's different analogies, which there's different metaphors for the Bhagavatam. And one of them is Mohini Murti, because it's the idea of if you, if you come with the wrong mentality, you become cheated, right? So this, this idea, so the sadhu is like that. The sadhu also has, I remember hearing this from my spiritual master and I never understood it, to be honest. He said also the sadhu has that potency whereby if you, if you have a cheating mood, then you will not get what they actually have to give. So it's, it, it's unfortunate because in our modern society, we don't have that culture of respect. And part of it is that we think that everyone's the same, right? But in spiritual life, everyone is respected. And then those who've taken more responsibility, those who are more elevated, they're given additional respect. So the baseline is we respect everyone. And then there's additional respect given according to the individual. If we have that culture, then we become empowered. Why? Because the blessings come from above to below. So what we have in modern society are people who lack empowerment and, and they don't know it, but the lack of empowerment is because of a lack of respect. It's a lack of being cultured. So we don't receive what is being offered. Okay. And Antichari, any other questions? Very good, Sir Prabhu, thank you. So I'd like uh, to ask um, Radha Bhakti to ask her question, if you can unmute. Thank you, Hari Prabhu, what a wonderful class. Um, so my question is, 
around achieving peace and unity in this day and age. Um, it just feels really, really, really hopeless um, with what's happening in the world. And so my question is, how can we elevate people's consciousness if people care more about being politically correct and are up in arms when our or any philosophy doesn't match their misplaced, misplaced ideals of compassion? That's a brilliant question. Thank you for that. It's a very, clearly a very intelligent question. I've been thinking about this a lot over the last few years. <laughs> There's a lot that can be done. See, luckily, luckily, Krishna consciousness is so powerful, it actually doesn't matter what people think, to be honest with you, right? But what, what does matter, there's a few factors. First of all, we have to be compassionate in the sense of, and this is explained by Prabhupada in First Canto chapter four, text number one in the purple. We have to be compassionate. In that purple, Prabhupada speaks about how, he says you shouldn't change the, the, the ultimate meaning, but it has to be presented in such a way that is relevant for the particular audience and he says this is called realization right so because our culture deals with the ultimate reality of everyone and it deals with all aspects of human existence sociology environmentalism um you know nature um male female psychology meditation mindfulness health everything is dealt with so the first thing is to find how do what what's the point of connection with this individual or, with, or this particular group but the second thing, the second thing, this is really important, is we have to be on fire spiritually ourselves. See, what happens is if we are Krishna conscious ourselves, it spills over, right? I'm, I'm going to tell you something that, that happened to me in my early days in Krishna consciousness. It didn't happen since, and it's, not, it's nothing to do with me. I think it, it must be because of the association. When I first came to Krishna consciousness, because my family were not into it, I didn't make a big deal. I didn't, I didn't speak so much about it because it's a Christian family. And I remember, I remember one day because, you know, I was living in my parents' house, in, this is many years ago, and my youngest brother, his name is Bismarck, and he told me one day, he said to me, he said, Eddie, he said, even when you're not there, he says, somehow I feel like you're always there with me, watching me, inspiring me and guiding my behavior. Now, that definitely wasn't me, but what I understood is that because I was trying to make some connection, there's some spillover effect. It, it really is like that. If you're properly connected, then what happens is that by your connection with your bona fide spiritual master, who is deeply connected to Prabhupada and Krishna, therefore the transcendental mercy, it, it flows. That is why so many Prabhupada's followers, they were able to do things. It's not their adhika necessarily, but it's Prabhupada's mercy flowing through the individual and empowering them. So the compassion is how we express the teachings in a way that's relevant and relatable to the audience. But the other side is that if you're on fire, if you're connected, then they can also receive something through that connection. You know? I remember hearing a class by Bhakti Tirtamaj, he said that when we give class, if we're going to some audience and so on, and we're not able to, to just directly get to the Krishna and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, he said you should do it with a, with a mood of regret. He said there should be a mood of regret. He said that way you don't become, you never become, you never go into the space of thinking it's all about the secondary, right? But, you, but, you're, but you're preparing them because you want to get them to a point where you can give them more of the direct. Right? So we may speak about environmentalism from the Vedas and so on, but we want to plant some connection so that they at least honor the teachings, appreciate the Vedas, want to inquire more, then maybe they'll get a book, maybe they'll come to another program, maybe they'll meet us, they'll, we can introduce them to a sadhu, whatever it is. So if I'm on fire, I can set other people on fire. Bhaktivinoda Thakur speaks about this. He speaks about different devotees at different levels of potency and what they can inculcate in other individuals based upon their level of advancement. So the more advanced an individual becomes, the more they can give Krishna consciousness to other people, the more they can raise someone very quickly to a higher state of spiritual life. So when devotees said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada is, it is said in the, in the Vedas that for someone to come to the point of chanting the holy names, they, may have, they must have bathed in all the holy rivers, you know, given in charity, they gave a list of all these things. And there is a verse that says this. And this is a Prabhupada, we don't feel that we've done any of this stuff. 
Prabhupada said, I am your pious credit. What does that mean? It means that if you're a billionaire, you can make someone a millionaire overnight. They may have no money, but you've got so much. They just have to be open and favorable and what you have to give them, they can receive. So that's actually how it works. So there's two forms of Krishna consciousness. There's two, two dynamics that go on in our preaching. One is what, the, the, what we teach externally, and the other is what we are internally. There's actually three factors, to be honest. There's what we teach externally, there's what we are internally, and then there's also the adhikar of the individual that we're preaching to. There's an interplay of these three factors that determine the reaction. So yeah, so on that basis, we should make sure that the, the factors that we can control, that is our own connection with Krishna, and also our, how well we, we try to present the teachings in a way that's meaningful, relevant, attractive to the audience. We take care of those two, and then Krishna takes care of everything else. Thank you for your question. Hare Krishna. So we have a question from Indy. The question is, how can decision makers who aren't specialized in a particular field figure out who is advanced or not? Well, again, to be honest, it is, it is there in scripture. There are symptoms, if you read and study, and there's loads of seminars on this topic. If you read and study, you can actually, to be what's, what's actually meant to happen by proper studying of the philosophy, you should know where you are and you should have a sense of where other people are as well, right? Because all the different stages, they have symptoms, the different types of adhikar, there are symptoms, all everything. Yasya lakshanam proktam. Narada Muni explains this in the Bhagavatam. Things can be understood by their lakshana, by their symptoms. So where we're not sure, and even if we are sure, we can still also get confirmation from those who are more advanced than we are. And in that way, there's no loss. There's no loss. But it's very important, therefore, that we should also try to study regularly. Because if I'm studying regularly, if I'm getting a clear understanding, then, then the, to be honest, the world becomes really clear. You look, it's clear. Everything's clear. I get it. Like, this is the, where this person is. This is why they're acting the way that they do. This is where this person is. This is why they're acting the way that they do. A lot of our frustration in life is because we have the wrong expectations. And rather than our expectations being based upon Guru Sadhu Shastra, they're based upon our own material conditioning. So we have a standard which is wrong, it's materialistic, and then people can't live up to it, then we become disturbed. But if you have Shastric knowledge, you, then, then the Shastra will tell you, okay, this is what you can expect of the Kanishta Adhikaris. This is what you can expect of Madhyams. This is what you can expect of Uttamas. It's not what I feel that they should be like, it's what the scripture says you can expect. And in that way, you, you don't get disturbed. Yeah, oh, someone, you know, they may be acting a certain way. I understand. This is where they are in spiritual life. I was at that stage before as well, and, and so on and so forth, you know, and we help each. And most importantly, if we practice properly, then it builds compassion. So wherever people are, it doesn't matter. What matters is we help everyone to come up. From wherever someone else is, we help everyone to come. And if they're more advanced than us, we take shelter. So we can receive that knowledge, receive that blessing, and we can come up. So I help other people to come up. I also go to those who can help me to come up as well. The two things go one hand in hand. Thank you so much, Bhutabhav and Prabhu. I can't actually hear you, Nantacharya. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Bhutabhav and Prabhu. So um, we have likely one last question. This is from Vivek. He asks, after 50 years of ISKCON, in your view, out of the seven purposes of ISKCON, which one is most successfully implemented and which one needs most attention to be given to in the present time? <laughs> mm, okay, that's an interesting question. 
but this is this is this is actually just a personal view so i've got the seven purposes in front of me so let's just go through together in terms of systematically propagating spiritual knowledge and marriage touched upon this yesterday definitely it's gone the books have gone out by the millions okay by the millions and definitely you know even in other media there's Prabhupada's books are online Prabhupada's books are on audio form Prabhupada's books are on, on video form the books the, the the knowledge has been going out and continues to go out so i think that's very strong to propagate a consciousness of krishna as he's revealed in the bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam because those books are going out that is definitely being propagated now we'll talk about this maybe in the next session how much we're all imbibing this that we could that's another question for us to ask ourselves but definitely that's that consciousness and understanding krishna stu bhagavan swayam which is the Paribhas Sutra, the Emperor verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the Srimad Bhagavatam is the, is the ripened fruit on the tree of Vedic knowledge. So of all the Vedas, you actually don't need to read any of the other Vedas. If you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, that one book is enough to deliver everyone and to deliver the entire world. Yeah? But that's been done. So number three, to bring members of the society together, that, that's often challenging. Our community dynamics has so many challenges. So I would say that there's more that we could do in that point. The teaching encourages Sankirtan movement, congregational chanting of the holy names of God, and to reveal the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Definitely the books about Lord Chaitanya. Prabhupada is interwoven that teaching throughout his books. That's there. And um, the chanting is going on. Kirtan is huge, but we could do more in terms of that as well. That's definitely another factor. To erect for the members in the society at large a holy place of transcendental pastimes dedicated to the personality of Godhead. Prabhupada has been extraordinarily successful. We have, we have our Vrindavan centers. We have, um, we have centers around the world. We have um, you know, Mayapur, which Prabhupada said is his headquarters. That is very, very successful in that sense. To bring the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a simple and more natural way of life. That's probably one area that we need to pay more attention to. You know? That's definitely something that we need to pay more attention to. Marsha, do you want to say, make a comment? You, you said it for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, last one is what, what I've been trying to emphasize. <laughs> yeah, so we could do more in number six, definitely. And then with a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes, the publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. So Prabhupada wanted his own followers to write. And we do see that happening. But there's, of course, more. There's always more that we can do. Because we sometimes think, well, we've got Prabhupada's books, but it's not just a question of how much Prabhupada's books are there. It's a question of looking at Prabhupada's books and the Krishna conscious teachings in relation to all the other teachings in the world. You see, this is a big view. When Prabhupada, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to create one religion or just a mat. As Maharaj said, he's trying to re-spiritualize the entire world. So when you look at it from that perspective, you have to think, okay, so how many books are there outside which are not purporting anything spiritual? And we're, we're looking at the teaching in relation to everything else that is actually out there. It's a mass mission, right? Prabhupada, I mean, he was so ambitious. I mean, in, in a spiritual way, he really, he's, he's really focused and he means it. When Prabhupada says, I want to take over the world, he really means it. I remember, I used to do Pujari service at um, ISKCON London, just like sweeping the floors and so on. And while we were doing it, they, 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 um, there was, I think there were disciples of Tamal Krishnamaraj. There was a pastime that Tamal Krishnamaraj was speaking about where Prabhupada was towards the end of his life on this planet. And they got his chart done, just for fun. Just for fun, they got the chart done. And the astrologer said, this, the chart of this person, this person's chart is so auspicious that the, the, the only conclusion that I can reach by reading his chart is that this person must be an empowered incarnation of God. That was the conclusion that they made. And when they told Prabhupada, this is what the astrologer said, Prabhupada is, he said, actually, that is a fact. The chart was so auspicious, he must be an empowered incarnation of God. So he's come empowered to actually change the entire world. It, it is literally as if the Lord was walking on the planet to actually make, a, make the change. And I remember hearing from Shiv Ramai that when Prabhupada was on the planet, 
everywhere in the world you could feel his energy. His capacity to feel that connection because he was just he was just that powerful. Huh? He really was that powerful, and the power doesn't stop. By the way, his potency is still available because anyone who's connected him by service, that that connection is available. Thank you so much, Bhutta Baba and Prabhu. I'd like to uh, say something. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, based on what uh, Buddha Baba made before and Prabhupada's genius in, in starting this movement and how he designed things. And one thing that was interesting is that when Prabhupada was looking for a, a, uh, a series of words to describe our movement, he came, the first presentation was the International Society for God Consciousness. That was the suggestion. And then Prabhupada said, no, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And then the response was, if we do that, then we'll limit people. And that'll be very exclusive. And Prabhupada said, no, actually, uh, if you say God consciousness, they'll bring in all kinds of gods, and then there'll be no clear understanding of what is God or who is God. And then our movement will be directed in so many different ways. We are talking about the Supreme God, Lord Sri Krishna himself. Even though it was revolutionary, even the people who were hearing it didn't understand what Prabhupada was saying. It sounded exclusive. It sounded a little bit, you know, like uh, uh, too much, yeah, too much in, in an exclusive way. Still Prabhupada stuck to that. And because of that, our society is still going on strongly. We could imagine if it was entitled God Consciousness, we would be a, a gamut of everything and anything that is spiritual thrown into that and said, well, it's all related to God. But Prabhupada had that vision to see, to keep the, the, the movement streamlined towards the Supreme God of all gods, Lord Sri Krishna himself. And gradually people started to understand that as Prabhupada was preaching about who is Krishna and what is his, his position. So I thought that was a kind of a genius that Prabhupada could foresee that. And this is as what Bhutta Bhavan was saying, the prof prophetic aspect of Prabhupada's designing of our whole society sort of facilitated certain things that he's put in place to prevent our movement from going in different directions and keeping it in the direction of Krishna, of Krishna consciousness. So it sounded like a small thing when it was happening, but actually it, would, it probably saved our movement. If Prabhupada would have went along with the idea of God consciousness, we don't know where we would be today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Buddha Bhavan Prabhu, that is, uh, that was the last of the questions, but um, I'd just like to uh, bring it back to you if you would like to uh, share anything further. No, I think that's for you speaking for a long time. I guess the only thing I'd say is please do do that introspection. Think about that first purpose. We'll do the other six in the next class. Think about the, the first purpose. Think about yourself in relation to that first purpose. Okay? Because if we if we take this and understand it, there's a lot of blessings to be had from the Acharya. We progress by blessings. The blessings come by pleasing the pure devotees. So Prabhupada, he gives a number of ways by which we can please him. If we take it on board, to be honest, it's not even just that. Krishna consciousness, if it's done properly, it's exciting, it's joyful, it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's interesting. It's just, there's just huge amounts of excitement to be had in, in, in propagating the mission. So if we take that first purpose, think about what it means for you, write down your reflections and share it with someone. Because if you share something, it goes deeper into you. So it becomes part of that process of change and accountability. So this is what I took from it. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm going to do it better or do it in a, in a, in a, in a more efficient way, whatever it is. How do I apply that first principle? That's what I'd like to do as homework. Can I say one more thing? 
as much. Yeah, using your, the same principle for understanding and development, systematic and repetition, um, a lot of our devotees are plugged into mainstream media. And so they're getting the same type of pattern of systematic data coming in a repetitious way. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it works on the subtle body. And we start to internalize that, although we might not fully accept it we're actually internalizing it and it does create doubt and confusion if we continue to do that. So I would suggest very strongly that in any way we should de detach ourselves from all kinds of external media in any form and here particularly from Prabhupada and from Prabhupada's representatives on everything as you mentioned and as it's already been clearly understood Everything is there in Prabhupada. Everything is there in Prabhupada's teachings. Everything is there in his books. Everything is there in those who are practicing what he gave us. And so we don't need to go outside for information on anything. When I say anything, I mean anything. Everything is there. If you want to learn about health, it's there. If you want to learn about how to make money, it's there. <laughs> anything you want to learn about, it's within ISKCON. And it has the culture of goodness attached to it and not the culture of passion and ignorance, which is exploitive and destructive. So the demons in the material societies, they use the same thing, systematic repetition to get people to buy into whatever they're saying. And that's how they brainwash people. We have to be careful, even though we're so much connected a lot of times to the outside world to not to be able to, again, take the same process that is very successful but coming from the wrong source. I just wanted to make that point because, you know, we do that too, systematic repetition of the wrong thing <laughs> from the wrong sources. Because <laughs> that's powerful. If you want to get somebody to, if you want to get somebody to believe something or do something, just keep saying it over and over and over again in a very systematic way, and it has effect. It has an effect. So, you know, secular society do do do, do that does that to sell products, to sell ideas, to and to uh, you know put out their propaganda in different ways. And unfortunately, our society is a lot of it. We're plugged into that that sound vibration, and we and when we start when we start plugging into that, we start seeing that well, yeah, pro, what Prabhupada said is nice, but it was a time, place, and circumstance. And the point you made, which is very important, it was Prabhupada made everything good for all time, all people, in all circumstances. He had that foresight. But we don't see that. A lot of times we think, oh, well, yeah, what Prabhupada said was good in the 60s or maybe even in the 70s or even a little after, but times are changing. The principles don't change. The application may be a little bit different in how the principles are used, but um, whatever Prabhupada gave us, I'm reading, I'm reading Bhagavatam now, and I'm seeing clearly what's happening today through Krishna's pastimes. It's amazing. <laughs> Just by reading Krishna's pastimes and Prabhupada's explanations of the pastime, you can see the, this pleasant social and political scenario that's going on. It's that, it's that deep, these, these books. You said it so brilliantly that I, all, I, all I could do is just try to repeat what you said. Oh, Mark, you have the realization. I'm just speaking. You have no, the yeah. <laughs> I'm just words. Uh, no, you just. <laughs> no, thank you. That was the most brilliant class. There was so much in that, that it needs to be heard again and again. Okay, so should we end? Thank you again, uh, Buddha Bhavan Prabhu and Maharaj uh, for your deep insights.
Maharaj has already said so wonderfully that, you know, we need to hear this class again and again. And so it really goes into the uh, depth of our consciousness and, and our activities. So uh, Maharaj, with your permission, I would like to uh, go forward with the next part of the program. Mother Soma Dutri has organized a kirtan for us. Yes, please. I think the devotees are re all ready. <laughs> okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you, dear devotees from Panchatattva's temple. So we have one more kirtan.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. That was a mind blowing, ecstatic kirtan. I'm sure that you'll all agree. Uh, I think Sri Devi Mataji set the standard for uh, enthusiasm <laughs> as well as a few others. Okay.
Sangi Nitai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Vo. So uh, I was I was gonna ask Maharaj if he would like to uh, do the Premadwani prayers. I feel it's appropriate considering that you know today we've been discussing the importance of a culture of respect and glorification of devotees. So we'll just take a couple of more minutes. We'll just quickly do Premadwani prayers. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Parahamsa Parivraja Charya Sutra Sata Shri Srimad AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananda Koti Vaishna Brinda Ki Jai Namacharya Shila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Is Confounder Charya Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Premseko Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sarigora Bhakta Brinda Ki Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopakopinath Shamakunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhana Ki Jai Shri Vrindhavan Dhamma Ki Jai Shri Mayapur Dhamma Ki Jai Shri Jagannath Puri Dhamma Ki Jai Ganga Maya Yamuna Maya Ki Jai Tusi Devi Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Shri Harinam Sankirtana Ki Jai Brihat Mardanga Ki Jai Sama Veda Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai all glories to the assembled devotees, Hare Krishna. All glories to the assembled devotees, Hare Krishna. All glories to the assembled devotees, Hare Krishna. Gora Premanande, Hare Hare Bo. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Goranga. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us for the last three hours. Uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we'd like to Again, thank His Holiness Chandramali Swami and His Grace Bhutabhama Prabhu for facilitating this uh, wonderful workshop this afternoon. And we look forward to part two tomorrow, which uh, will begin at 12 p.m. UK time. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. And we'll just conclude by offering our Vaishnava pronouns, Vanchakalpa Tirubhyascha. Kripa Sindhu Bya Evacha Patitana Bhavanevyo Vaishnavyo Namo Namaha Srila Prabhupada Ki Thank you so much everyone. Hare Krishna.